What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Christoph Zürn, who has invented the method of music thinking. And we dive deep into the analogy of music and how different types of music can represent different types of organizations. Is it more an orchestra that needs a conductor or is it more in jazz ensemble that needs improvisation? So we are speaking about the complexity of organizations and the simplicity of a good analogy and the beauty of music and the work of facilitation and all of that. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And if you want to learn more about facilitation and improve your own skills, check out the Never Done Before Academy with live online courses on various topics, neverdonebeforeorg slash courses. And now, enjoy the show. Hello, Christoph. Welcome to the show. Hello, Miriam. Nice to be here. Yeah. Very much looking forward to our little exploration into the world of music and facilitation and design thinking, maybe. Yeah, for sure. And I always kick it off with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Yeah, I do. Exactly the time I don't really remember, but it might have been, let's say, when I changed from being a creative director to a freelance. And maybe the story is, as a creative director, you're the one making decisions at the very end. Mm -hmm. So you're the one, to, you know, it's not what you want. You want the team to come up with something. But if this doesn't work, you're, let's say, the decision maker of last resort. And I think oh, there were moments where I thought, oh, I made the decision too quick. Mm. I didn't hear that person. Or, hey, this person was very quiet on that day. Or there was new information. So I think when I changed being on the payroll of an agency, going into freelance uh, world as um, a creative companion, that's the, the company name. So that's also, let's say, a program. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so... My work is to help others to come up with the ideas and make decisions. And later I realized that there's a word for it, facilitation. facilitation. Beautiful. And I wonder how would you now select the gigs in a way that you don't have too much of an opinion? Because I can imagine that it's very difficult as a creative director. You're, you're also paid for having opinions and to know what's good enough and what's not. And as a facilitator, suddenly you have to almost censor yourself. Right. Maybe stupid to say, I think, and maybe people who know me maybe tell you totally the difference. I think I have a small ego. So <laughs> I think I always like to listen. That's part of my program, let's mm -hmm. say. And then if I don't like it, or if I find something about it, I would discuss it. And okay, if we can't make a decision then as a creative director you do but you have heard the other party so on the other hand if you do your own projects like and i have a i had a, a lot of side projects that i did then you're not only the creative director you're also the one who's doing everything mm -hmm. and there i don't make any compromise so because that's more about me than about, let's say, the, the others and the other side. Yeah. So you can really switch roles. It's beautiful. Yeah. I think that's, that's something I'm intentionally do. So the question is, what's my role? And I also think a facilitator is just one of many roles. Mm. And you, you can use facilitation in different ways. So we, we can take, uh, dive into later. In, oh, in please go ahead. <laughs> go right in on the other end sometimes you're a host you have to mm. greet people you have to welcome them and you could say oh that's also facilitation but it's also very yeah very much being a host being there mm. one. or sometimes you're a teacher 
when talking about d different concepts and you see that people work in a certain way and you say, oh, they, do, they really don't understand the concept. So yeah. then you have to help them. And that doesn't mean so now I have my teacher hat on and now I have my facilitator. I think facilitation brings yeah, most of them together. But mm -hmm. sometimes it's a role where, where I think in a workshop, okay, now I have to, to make a break and to say, hey, do you guys know this or that? And then most of the people say, yeah. And then you see, oh, okay, we have to help them. <laughs> say, okay, for the one who doesn't know or because I like so much to explain it to you, and then you you help them. And I think yeah. that that makes um, often a difference. Say, oh, oh, yeah, we knew it, but we never heard it that way. So <laughs> that's also for me some kind of yeah, facilitation, teaching, whatever. Yeah, interesting. Absolutely. And I wonder whether there is a difference between facilitator capital F, where you really step into the space to facilitate a process, or whether you are a teacher or host or a trainer who facilitates. Yeah. And then it's small F, which is, yeah, we use the same tools, but somehow the, the hat we are wearing is a different one. Yeah. And if you say big F and small F, I would say, is there also a middle F or a very <laughs> tiny F? So it's like from pianissimo to forte, if we take musical <laughs> attributes. So um, for me, it's not uh, binary in that way, either this or the other, or big or small. I think it's okay. more like, yeah. So would the companion then be a middle F? <laughs> a medium-sized F? Or how does... Oh. How did, what does companion mean to you? Companion means if you're, give it a name, a consultant, a creative, or or an, an interim uh, guy or a freelancer, um, you always start. And when you start, you know there will be an end of a project. Or yeah, It's like, like doing a walk together. You accompany that person to walk that way in a better way that they can do alone. So that's companionship. And companionship is also not being the owner, but being a co-owner. Yeah, so it's not about you help them, but you also, sometimes you also ask for help in your role. Yeah. So it's accompanying and, and, and it's not in that way, it's not offensive to other people. So I realized when I was creative director and you come into a company, you say, oh, creative director. And funny enough, if you have another kind of director uh, in the room, it's like, Oh, okay. Now, who has the last word? And I, mm. I, I think I, I never really did that game because I don't like that kind of games. So I thought, hmm, why can't I be just a companion? So I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm not a dangerous person. I just accompany you. So in in doing what what we all agree, what we should do. And if this is facilitation or not, you know, I just I just came up with the name creative companion. And then the question was, hang on, do you accompany us in a creative way or do you accompany creatives? Mm. And, and the answer is yes. So <laughs> <laughs> it's about creativity and it's about a companionship, mm -hmm. being a part of. And that's also very musical. Sometimes you could play in that band and then you play in the other band. But if you play in the other band, you don't think, oh, I would rather be in the first one. So it's like you, you be there, you help, you work together, but there's a beginning and there's an end. This makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I'm glad that I asked. I have the impression that I'm decomposing now all the different parts because the creativity. So you compared it to music. And I wonder, I think with music and with creativity, we often have these mental blocks or limiting beliefs that I'm not musical. I'm not creative. Is it similar that these are just, in your opinion, limiting beliefs? Can we learn? music can we learn creativity or how do you help people to find more comfort in there yeah i, th I think i can help people to yeah how do you call it to remove the barrier of, of their limited thinking and <laughs> because we all are creative full stop mm -hmm. and they can be creative in in totally different fields and in, to in, in do totally different ways so it's like understanding that that's a nature And you, you, I'm sure you know Joseph Beuys, the the the, the mm. biggest mm. artist of the 20th century, yes. and he he really said everyone is creative. Everyone is an artist. In the, he, he said, 
And um, and I think it's true. So, it's, you know, some people can have a boring job or thinking they're not creative, but at the end of the day, they might cook or play with the kids in a way where they think, hey, that's different than what you did at your work. And, you know, and you not necessarily have to give it a name. So if some people like to condition that they are not creative, so, yeah, if this is what they, what they want to think, but there will be moments where they are creative sometimes to solve a problem or to just have fun or play with something. I actually like it. It makes me think of how can we bring this hidden side of creativity more into the space once we work together as a group. So to first priming them, okay, where in your life are you creative? Are you, how do you play with your kids? How do you cook? And then how can you use this kind of energy or curiosity or mindset in a workshop or in a work context? Mm. And what does music have to do with all of that? Yeah, you, you know, I started something called music thinking. And that was, yeah, I kind of tell you, actually, it's it's like bringing everything what I did before together. Maybe that's more like like, like a symphony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and with everything that, that I did before. So I have a very um, strong, not strong, very diverse um, patchwork a CV. I like to do things. I'm, yeah. And if I and I'm, I'm a good starter, but I'm also a good finisher. Mm -hmm. So that's I start, rare. Oh, now, funny if I start something, most of the time I always finish it. That makes some kind of yeah, there's some kind of pressure. But but or I don't even do it again. So maybe. But if I really say, oh, that's interesting, then I will always find a way to bring it to 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 a certain point. Like the yeah. companion. Like, like a companion, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and by the way, funny enough, if you work for a client, they can call you back, so <laughs> you can c accompany them again. So if they if people understand that you help them to do something and that you stop and you're good friends, and you, you might never see them uh, again, but sometimes you you, you do it again. You, mm. say, I would need you for another project, or I, I know someone who uh, would be, and, and that's that's the nice the nice thing to do, and actually to draw the analogy here is like it depends on the kind of musician that 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 you are so there are musicians like in a let's say in a certain rock band you just start the band with your friends and then you stay for it forever <laughs> so i think there are many groups <laughs> that that do it that way before they break up maybe but more in jazz or also in classical music you play in different uh, ensembles Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, in classical music, you see if you go to a concert and you have three, uh, maybe three pieces that they play, you see that they change uh, from piece to piece. And some people play in that piece and not in the other. Some others come in. And that's also the way how, how things go together. And if you're in jazz, it's very common to play also in, a, in, another, uh, in another band. So, yeah, that's... My way of thinking is like, um, if I think like a musician, then that's more easier to co-create because musicians are natural collaborators. And if I think in, in ways of design, then it's most of the time more yeah, a specialty or anything else. And no, nothing wrong with design. I was um, working in design quite um, yeah, some decades. But music is just the overarching thing for me. And I realized that this also helps me and my clients to understand better what they do. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to peel the onion a little bit. because There's so much in there in what you just shared. And maybe starting with musicians are collaborators by nature. And somehow it's funny because I can think of the crazy composer who is just by themselves in their, <laughs> in their little room to compose music, but then obviously they're composing it for someone else to bring it to life. And they're the musicians who are playing the music or even with the band composing together. So what is this mindset or skill set that then helps us, would help us outside the music. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the core of what I want with music thinking, because otherwise I would have called it just music. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's like the analogy. And what you just said, maybe we or no, I should uh, stop with 
calling something a musician because there are many different types of musicians. And like we just talked about in, in, in the roles of the facilitator, sometimes you're that facilitator and sometimes the big F, uh, small F, middle F and any variations in it. And But if I look at the field of music, what you just said, like in organizations and talking about leadership, you often hear, let's say, the then metaphor of a conductor, the mm -hmm. one who tells all the others what to do. And I never use the word metaphor because I always use an analogy. Mm. And because metaphor wants to make a point. So this is this. And because this is this, that is that. That's mm. what it does. Politicians do this. And they say, oh, we just do captains of industry. Oh, yeah, captains of industry. It's like a big boat. There's one person with a, with a, with a different uh, kind of hat. And he's the one who making all the decisions. And that's why we should do. But analogy for me means like, okay, if what we are doing in a project, in a workshop, or in our organization, what kind of musical genre would this be? Mm. How many people are playing? How did they come to this, what we just heard. And then you will see from, oh, we could go into the direction of, let's say, classical music, where one composer <laughs> writing everything down, giving actually instructions mm -hmm. for other people. And there are people that are trained to read the instructions and play it in a perfect way. And you need a person that helps them to train, helps them to hear the music before they can play, helps them to understand what are others playing while you are playing this or mm. while you're not playing, and helping them in the performance to synchronize. So that's one kind of music. And you could also see, if you want to do this in, in an analogy, you could say, oh, that's maybe a, a multinational. So there's a big organization where we are organized. Let's take Wagner's ring with, uh, I don't know, 250, no, even more people on stage and, and, and uh, a choir and people, let's say, in the, in the orchestral pit. How do you bring these people together? So that's a big organization. And there you don't improvise on the stage. On the other mm -hmm. hand, you could say, let's go more into our century where everyone with a computer can make music uh, with all the tools that we have and then go into the studio. And then you have the, the leadership role of a producer, a producer. Most of the time, like the conductor also does not make any sound. The conductor doesn't make any sound. That's interesting. Mm. Sound is made by the people itself. It's like... If you again want to also put in the analogy of the facilitator, you could say the facilitator is also not making any sound in between uh, airports. Yeah. He's the one coordinating based on the briefing, let's say the score from the composer or however you want it, and, and helping them doing this. But if you're a producer in the studio, you also have to understand when to have a, when to make a break, when to send the people, let's say, go record store shopping to get new inspirations to come in with a new mind or to say from, hey, maybe we could invite that person for that part. So you're just more, yeah, it's com completely different. It sounds much more like um, a marketing-driven organization because mm -hmm. the goal is to sell the record. That's what a producer does. And it's like if you're just a multinational and you write everything down, then it's the performance on stage. In the studio, you just do this for any other different way of where the music will be heard. It could be a playlist, a composition, or, you know, whatever. And both of them don't make any sound. If we go into another segue, into another field of music, like um, improvisation, mm. like Baroque music, Uh, Baroque music like uh, uh, Bach and 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 Handel uh, and and even Beethoven um, in his early days he was a super he was a cool improviser. I would have not thought of these thinking of improvisation. I would have gone in the jazz direction. Hey, yeah, let's start. Yeah, can, please continue. <laughs> I'm intrigued. And because and, and it's a very long answer to your short question. I don't use it as a metaphor. I just want to open the field of music and then try to find out, okay, how does this sound in blues? Okay, there's a certain structure like in, in Baroque music, 
or in, 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 in traditional jazz. But hey, what if we go to free jazz? We get on the stage, we take a moment of silence, and then someone starts playing and the others play too. And they segue in ways that you could not have composed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the moment. And the improviser is also making a noise. That's a difference in improvisation. So it's much more a startup or a, a different, a smaller uh, unit. And sometimes you don't know who's the leader, who's the follower. And because both of them are very much in the dynamic. And if we segue again into another field, <laughs> and then we might go into the field of, um, let's say, indigenous music. Mm. Let's not forget that there's music that is not heard or not heard as much on uh, on Spotify or any other commercial thing. There, there, There's music at home. People make music at home. And sometimes it's from a tradition. They they just um, you have a guru. If you talk, uh, let's say, to talk about uh, Indian music, and um, if you if you go further, like um, Australia, the didgeridoo, or mm -hmm. so or the shakuhachi in Japan. So there's a big field that draws a lot from the tradition and the meaning what it should be, and it doesn't change by every trend or everything else. And most of the time, the guru is the master of, of play. So they also make a sound. And that's actually, when, when I open the field in that way, the question is like, how do you sound as an organization? Where mm. are you? And, and what is the purpose and the goal? So is it conservation, like in the traditional music? Is it improvisation, creativity, innovation? Or is it effective functioning? Like in the orchestra. Right. And everything are good. That's the good thing with music. No, one is not better than the other. It's just different for mm. different purposes. Yeah. It reminds me of, I recorded a podcast with Sam from Song Division. And what they do is they invite groups to compose their own music that would represent them. It reminds me of that, what you just described that a team or an organization first has to think of what kind of music are we actually, what would be the right analogy or the right box for us to fit in. Right. And then it's interesting because pushing it further of what you touched upon is then also the kind of people you need are very different. So someone who's willing and able and maybe even passionate of following processes and scripts is someone very different of someone who enjoys the improvisation, who hears maybe just the rhythm and then has the musicality to improvise along with it. Right. So there, there are different types of musician. And, and what you see in the analogy, if you have a classical composition, it's written out until all details. And in some way, it doesn't work. And then you would you would ask, let's say maybe half an hour before they go on stage, you already can put the curtain and say, "Oh wow, it's full house today." And then you ask them, "Okay, now the third part that doesn't work today, you just improvise, you guys." So, if we put that analogy, I think everybody understands. From okay, that might not work because the people maybe are not trained to improvise. Yeah. But if you use the analogy in business, sometimes we ask them to do. Oh, I love that. This is very powerful. Thank you. And I also see how then the facilitator is not a one size fit all. Because someone who's very good in facilitating a change process or a digital transformation for a multinational requires very different skills than someone who does an innovation workshop for a startup where there are more improvisers in the space. Yeah. And how do you let them, if, if they choose improvisation, how can you let them improvise better mm. or in more multiple ways? So that's a little bit also like ideation. If you only have a few ideas and you tell the people think creative, That doesn't work because it's still, let's say, they still think very creatively in, in their box. Yeah. So we have to come up with different boxes, like um, like musical genres. That we say, okay, this was now, let's say, blues. 
let's go to trip hop or to whatever one of the um, Spotify is tracking more than 6,200 different genre types. So, and, and that's in analogy. I think there are also so many different types of businesses. It's not always that business. Everybody's business is different. So why do you always go into this big directions and don't understand yourself, you know, how you're sounding as a business and how, and by the way, who's your audience? Because that's, uh, that, that should be a fit. So you can have a lot of fun making music by yourself, but at the very end, it's a performance. And, and if nobody listens. Right. And a performance no... has a beginning and an end. Yes. And if you had a, had a great performance, it's no 100% guarantee that next week it will be the same performance with um, if you don't rehearse and just work on your instrument during the week. Yeah. And that's a little bit sometimes different to to design. Design is is less performative, it's more a product and then it's ready and then you ship it and then some other people sell it. And I think in businesses we are never have one product we are always we are performing every day on different levels and that helps us to uh, um, that's why i think music for me works better because if we had a big success it doesn't mean we have it tomorrow if we just lean over and do something with it it's just now now we're on a we are on level two this means we have to to work even harder because there might be a level three we don't see it but it could be and yeah. it's like, like the the quote of um, pablo casals one of the biggest cello players in the world and when he was 90 i think the story goes like he he still was rehearsing every day for five hours and say and people ask him you're the biggest cello player in the world why are you rehearsing every day and his answer was yeah i think i think i can be better so there is something in performance meaning you you must have fun to perform and not just do lean over and do it again, maybe. Yeah. And again, there's so many, so many uh, ways we can dig deeper into that because A, what does it mean for the, we can always be better and rehearsing is, must be part of the process always. So how can we rehearse the creative process, the coming up with ideas, maybe even, and how can we help those who might be stuck in a box? How can we help the orchestra players to lean into improvisation so that if the conductor, one of the, one of the players is sick or cannot join, how can they fill the gap and deal with this disruption? Because that's eventually what we need, right? Even if we are a multinational with all the processes, if something goes wrong, we still need the machine to function. Right. I think to answer that question, if there is, let's say, one of the soloists is ill and you can't get another, you can't play the song. Mm -hmm. So this means that understanding what a producer does in the studio might be much more interesting for big organizations instead of always looking into classical music. And for, for, for me, often when, when I hear this, like, oh, we need a, a conductor, someone who's really organizing this, then I would say, okay, but then do you have a composer? So no, no, well, what do you mean? So the question is, why need a conductor if you don't have a composer? Or you would need a conducting composer. Gustav mm -hmm. Mahler was one of the biggest um, conductors in his time, but he, he he wrote great symphonies. So you, ah, okay, that's what, so it's it's about understanding. If you dive into the analogy, it gives you a vocabulary to talk about your own business in a different way. And can you... Can you help me understand what you mean in business terms, the differentiation between the producer and the composer and what it then means if you have one or the other or both? Yeah, I think that's the easiest way if, if, we, if we would have an example. But just to answer the question on a, on a general level, there is someone who is creative in writing down instructions what others should do. And there is a person that is so cool in letting people work better together like a scrum master for example so the whole agility is a part that that is very interesting but it's only interesting if you understand what to do 
agility is on efficiency and not on effectivity. Effectivity comes before when you write the score and when you test it and when you go and when you rehearse it and when you let people... Let Because people. the effectiveness is focused on the outcome and the efficiency is the way of working. Right, right. And these are two different skills. Yeah. So, so we can also segue into design thinking. So design thinking is pretty good to understand why are we doing this and maybe air quotes, maybe less in making it very efficient. In that sense, design thinking is less efficient, but very effective. Because but it takes so much very, time. Mm -hmm. Right. But, before you, uh, but if you're very, very efficient, like in agility, it could be you're very efficient in making a very mediocre thing very quickly, very good in time, in budget, that, is not, that has not the effect that you want, for example, that people buy it and like it and use it. Yeah. Fascinating. And that's such an important question to ask. I think many, especially small businesses and solopreneurs forget to ask whether they're focusing on an audience or clients who are abundant in time or abundant in money. And usually they're never both. They either have lots of time, but not so much money. And then you, it's better to be, you can have long processes um, that are effective. But if the client is abundant in money in short in time, you better be efficient. Right, right. But it means you have to be sure or yeah, secure with each other that what you're doing has the effect that it should have. Yeah. And we are in business and as a facilitator, sometimes you facilitate something where you think, oh, wow, this was a great workshop. Everybody everybody's, has these The, the eyes uh, and then said, wow, this was great. But you know that on Monday, they try to sell it to the management and they will fail because mm. every organization has an autoimmune system of, of uh, things that are new and they refuse it. So if you don't tackle also, let's say, the branding aspect or the yeah. organizational aspect, which for me, it's more or less the same, The brand experience, the the product experience, and also the experience with the organization should be one. And so, if you, if you just leave it out and you just do tests with with clients, mm. and the client says yes, I want it, maybe the organization says yeah, I understand, but that's not us. We don't we don't Ooh. do that. So, does this mean that in a design thinking process, where usually you have interviews, you empathize with the audience, with the clients, external clients, you are suggesting that it's equally important to also test it with internal clients. Yes. And even with the brand itself. Yeah. So I, I heard it so often that when, when in service design and service design, you're focused on the, on the end client. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's your focus. You won't say, okay, they want it. They would buy it they, and they would use it. And that's an important one. It's not only just about selling. It's about selling something that is meaningful, that they use it so that their lives get, it gets better. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we ruin our planet with stuff that no one needs. So th that's the important part. But, or no, let's say, and it's very important. And, and you, you're, not, or you're not ready here. The thing is, how does this also add to where we all say that our brand is for? Mm -hmm. How does this add? We, 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 could, we could do something that is tested perfectly with the client. They love it. They want it. But it might not fit our purpose. Should we do it? Hell no. Otherwise, we ruin our brand. But we need money. Hell, we have to do it. So, And that's something, if you understand that when you do it, it will have an effect on your brand. Because people say, oh, they're now doing this as well. And that is less where they are known for. So there actually is a change without knowing that you're changing. This is a very interesting conversation relating to the neutrality of the facilitator. So would you think that this is your role as the companion or facilitator to also know maybe before you start the process to know where are the guardrails, what is the canvas? And where does it stop? Or are the participants and the client, the stakeholders responsible for knowing, okay, this is maybe too much of a stretch? Yeah, it's a, it's a stretch anyway. Why, why, why shall we make our life easy 
when when everything is complex so why not make it complex so that it will be easy at the very end what do you mean by that <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know what i hear often in in organizations that we have projects to make stuff more easy mm -hmm. yeah okay simplicity we need simplicity facilitation mm -hmm. right but the funny thing is if you make it simple for yourself as an organization i can guarantee it will be extremely complex for your client because they have to do the translation work whatever so the, the funny thing is okay if we want simplicity as a brand it's not for us working efficiently we have to be effective for that the client has the idea this is simple and often this means that we can't do any shortcuts in our organization because it will have an, a negative impact or even a complex in, impact and but because making it simple like facile uh, so facile <laughs> and um, doesn't mean and and i think that's a misunderstanding of the word simplicity as well mm. the question is from yeah let's do it simple now that's too much too complicated but the question is what do you want to achieve with this and if your complication also leads to complication for your client mm -hmm. then i would say okay now we have to talk But if your simplicity doesn't solve the problem, then I'm a service designer very much again. <laughs> so then I would say, okay, but why should you do it? Because it's it's too complicated. It's in this this will not work. But because we put everything in so little boxes, mm -hmm. that's the advantage of agility, so that we get work done. On the other hand, if the box is small enough, you just lose the connection to the big hole. And you just deliver what's on your plate for this two or three week spread. True. And I think the to bring something to simplicity is very complex and requires a lot of work. And this is the ultimate beauty. And I, I guess that you can also find similarities again with music. Yeah, absolutely. That's There's the that's... simple patterns when you yeah, listen to the piano of Bach. It's just, it's so simple. Yeah, it's, it's very so complicated and very, yeah. very, uh, but may maybe there's another one um, that we could use here where I think the analogy works pretty good. It's like, if we talk about an orchestra, mm -hmm. where you need many people with great instructions, <laughs> like a score, and someone who helps them to get the best out of this music together. But if you can't afford it, you can sample it. Yeah? Then, then we're going into the direction of the producer. We sample it. Mm -hmm. But it's but if we perform it, there will not be an orchestra. There will just a big loudspeaker, and we will hear a similar sound. It's not one on one. But this is something where I say, okay, if you want that, you know, music is open for any remix of this. But the um, the source might be uh, orchestra, but the way how you do it could be either sampling or or with electronic instruments. You can create it in the same way so that it sounds equal. So it's not different and the performance will be will be different because as a DJ you're standing more or less alone on your on your DJ pit and in an orchestra you see the hundred people on stage and you you hear different things when when it's live and not just that one big sound but it helps to 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 make it cheaper better and maybe also for a diff for a different purpose hmm. i love the analogy there's so many layers and you can go in so many directions because you can also outsource outsource parts record them in different studios put them back together yeah and what do you think makes A workshop fail and what makes a music performance fail and are these the same or are they different hmm, that's a good question i think a workshop in that sense is not a performance but maybe more a rehearsal mm. so maybe yeah I didn't think about this before and there is a performative element in workshopping and also in rehearsing but it's not the performance for, for 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 the client so i think that also is open for making things wrong making mistakes, mistakes. and if we don't want to make mistakes in a, in a in a workshop i would say okay then you might have not needed the workshop so if there's just a smooth way going from one way to the other 
then yeah maybe maybe we missed something in or our bias uh, was too strong or or not the right people in the in the room so a rehearsal that could have been a paid performance yeah is not worth a rehearsal so i was just trying to translate the workshop where everything goes smooth and we have a perfect product at the end maybe we didn't need the workshop hang on that's maybe something else then we we have to shift again more uh -huh. to into improvisation because mm -hmm. improvisation is a performance mm -hmm. and it could also be a rehearsal but that works differently than if someone writes something down organizes 100 people and let them play in in in, in some way together yeah and by the way i learned in university that if you really want to understand the music for example classical music go to a rehearsal Ooh. You will, you, why that why that because then then they stop and say no um can we do 24 uh, x again and you horns you were just the tick too hard okay and then you hear from, oh i didn't hear this i know oh, okay so you, you you understand music much better when you when you're part part of a, a, a rehearsal sometimes they're open rehearsals and uh, then you also see how they work together and um yeah that's very interesting mm -hmm. as much as you learn about the functioning of a team or an organization if you go to their workshop right absolutely but in a rehearsal of an, an orchestra it's very clear so they don't have enough time okay. they in a, they have time box they have an expert uh, and everybody has to do what the conductor says but and the conductor by the way just to be clear the conductor is also a trainer he's also an educator mm. uh, he's, he's the one who knows the piece best and how it should sound and it's about committing also to this and helping to create that sound together. And it's not about the individuality, like one of the second violins in the last row, they say, okay, I only have to do this. That's not interesting, but it's an essential part of the whole. So that's also something. So what you do, it's not only about how you feel at your moment in doing this, because it's a part of the whole. And it's not necessarily about doing a lot or being very loud. And right. still having a very important part in the result and the whole. Yeah. I like that. So for you, what makes a workshop fail then? Yeah, fail is, I think there are different kinds of fails. So um, sometimes as a facilitator, your job is to have a smooth workshop that everybody is happy at the end and that they come up with the ideas that they like. I would say that that's where you're most of the time hired for. I would also call it a fail if I have the idea that this is just more like, let's say, design thinking theater. We already had that idea before. <laughs> and now we need a workshop to, yeah, to tell other people that we use design thinking for this idea because it's so good. So Design thinking theater, I've never heard that. Oh really? So it's uh, like classification. Yeah, I'm. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't inv um, uh, in invent, invent that. It. But it's something like doing something for, yeah. Let's say the strongest voice in 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 the organization. Say, oh, let's do this. I'm thinking these two these two weeks. Uh, sorry, this um, sprint or two days. And at the very end, uh, the result is actually what you already knew before. But now you also put your design thinking sauce around it and you can tell, yeah, we, we ask real people. The question is, are they real people? Were they real clients? Did or, we really listen? Right. Did they really <laughs> listen? Did we really listen what they say? Or did we, yeah, we might have listened to them, but maybe we didn't understand mm. what it meant. So it's... So, so that's something where I think that would be at the very end a fail. And it could also be a fail like what I mentioned earlier, like you work on something that the client wants, but the organization doesn't want or need to make the organization better or the brand. And yeah. that and that will also always be be a fight. But not but maybe that's not a fail. Maybe that's more an insight. Or the uh, or reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, maybe I'm I'm a bit sarcastic here. I think one of my biggest frustrations recently is when I work with a group and they're enthusiastic and they're having an outcome at the end, 
and they put their best people to it. And then after the workshop, they realized that actually the organization hasn't foreseen a budget to actually implement it or hasn't foreseen that the people in order to do the work after the workshop need time for that. Right. So even there, there are different layers. I think, yes, the solution could be not a cultural fit, but then it could also just not be implemented for so many other reasons, for instance, budget. Right. Well, I have to say, it's like insights. Every outcome can help you to either understand the organization better, your client better, or processes better. So I wouldn't say it, um, it wouldn't be wasted money, but it's maybe not clever as an organization to do it that way. And it could also be like that you learn how that kind of workshop works so that the next time you you can allocate the the, the budget. So I, I would not say that this is worthless or um, let's say, no reason to be sarcastic, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's like from, you know, there's a quote from Otto Sharma about theory, you, you know, systemic mm -hmm. thinking. And he said, you can just uh, understand the system when you try to change it. Mm. And, and, and that's something like, if you do a workshop like this, you try to change the system, then you realize, oh my God, that's the system. Here's the, here's the, the red line. And then if you know the red line next time, you can think about, hmm, how can we do this different so that that red line might be a little bit further away or maybe a dotted line or, you know, whatever. You know. Yeah, true. And you can only change the system from within. And therefore, it's so important to really engage and empower the participants so that they become the change agents yeah yeah and then i think it, that's over time i now realize and becomes i become more and more aware and forget less often to also have the conversation with the client then do you have a budget yeah what yeah. is the plan afterwards mm -hmm. yeah no that's the yeah that's often the the biggest thing because the budget is allocated with people that are mostly not in the workshop they have a different dynamic they under, don't understand it and the question or or maybe the the next workshop should be how can we or how might we find uh, given the fact that this workshop in this way is uh, such a great thing how might we help our organization to see the effectivity and also the impact of what we're doing so that we can plan different kinds of workshops uh, in the i don't know next um, half year or whatever that's a challenge i love that and i can see a fantastic design thinking process around it where they actually interview the people within the organization have to do the work we have to find the budget yeah and also ask them what they think so it's also like i had it with in workshops or in trainings <clears throat> where where there's a dynamic with service designers and you know we want to solve problems we want to make it better for the client and empathy is one of the cues that I'm using very much. But empathy doesn't mean only having empathy with the with the end client. Empathy also means having empathy with your organization, with your boss, with the CEO. Mm. So there, empathy is not a one way street. Oh, empathy. Oh, I see what you what you need. No, hell is I see what you need. I see what the organization need. I see, and then let's make this as visual or audible or whatever make it clear for everyone okay this is and and then we're closer to sometimes complexity but we need to understand the complexity until a certain uh, amount so that we can make it simple for us and for others but if we are only focusing on oh oh let's do a, a workshop how much time do you need oh in two days we can fix it and you know stuff like this and then you know in two days they can't fix it because in two days they come just with the inside what's the problem and how you could solve it but you don't fix the organization so everything has to be connected yes i love the different layers of empathy also empathy with ourselves that because I if we come up with a solution that kind of itches or we don't want to implement and or which will break us because we don't have the time and capacity. Also, won't work. And also, is it good for you? Mm. Is it good for doing a workshop or anything? I also have workshops or have did workshops where I had one or two moments during the workshop where I said, "Why am I doing this?" 
And if you have this every day, you, you should change something. <laughs> yes. But but I will not say that this is unnatural. It's also always good to be critical with yourself, yeah. uh, and and saying, okay, yeah, it brings bread on the table. But if this is your only argument, you will have maybe a lot of bread on the table, but nothing else. So, or you don't want to eat it anymore. So you, you have to understand, if you don't understand yourself, how can you understand other people? And if you can oh, yeah. understand other people, how can you stand your organization? So yeah. it all, it's all the same. No, no, it's not the same, but it's connected. And there are different perspectives. And that's where music comes in. Music is very good to hear different perspectives at the same time i can hear the violin and while the violin plays i can hear the horns i can even think oh there's even a, a, a drum after it or oh now the the contrabass comes later so this layered thinking that's really something that you can develop while listening to music and then understanding from oh it's like our, our organization while we're doing this The loudest part is here, but there's a small part there and it's changing over time. So it's also the joy, the joy of listening to yourself and to the organization and to yourself in the organization. Mm. Yeah. And the awareness that everyone has their place and not everyone wants to be the first violin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last week I recorded an episode on personality types and the elements from Chinese medicine. And now I wonder whether there are also personality types related to an orchestra. Are you more of the contrabass that is more for the yeah, yeah. In, a, in a band, oh. which is more for the rhythm or are you the first violin? Are you... um, I had in, in my podcast, I had one guest, she is doing like say what kind of instrument are you or a friend mm -hmm. of mine who is also working working uh, with, with this what kind of instrument are you and making connections with certain traits of behavior and, and mm -hmm. attitude linked to to a musical instrument and the one i just thought about was she's doing a survey And before the first meeting, she gets some results from the survey. And this is assigned to a certain instrument. So like from, hey, you're the saxophone because this, 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 and this is more typical for the saxophone. So for me, there it stops because for me, then it goes a little bit too much into a metaphor. But mm -hmm. anyway, if it works for people, be my guest. Because I can think that every instrument can have different traits. You can play a violin in thousand mm. different ways or a saxophone in thousand different ways. But let's let's keep it simple. <laughs> Although it's very complex. Let's keep it simple. Say, okay, that a saxophone, you have to use your breath. Mm. And if you're out of breath, you have to breathe in again. There are tricks like circular breathing. But that's another case. So in, as a violin, you can play one note very long because if you do this, you don't even hear when I'm just, you know, it's just about bringing the resonance to, to, to the violin. And, and the question is, okay, some people like this more and some other people like that more. So I think instruments and for me, it helps to think about this without making maybe too much conclusion so that, oh, you're such a trumpet or else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the distinction you make between a metaphor and an analogy, and let's not be too dogmatic or prescriptive for that. I sometimes ask people in the beginning of the workshop, if you would be a musical instrument, what would it be? Mm. It's a beautiful warm-up question. Do you have an idea, Miriam? What would be your instrument? Mm. I think I would be a piano. Because yeah. although it's very structured, there is a clear structure on how to play it. And still you can improvise and use it in different ways. And yeah, I think that's... that's Do you like the overview of the piano so that, that you can see the field, what you're doing? And yes, and there are clear boundaries of what you can do and what you can't do. Hey, and there's a, a rhythm mm -hmm. five and of, of the black and, and, the, and the white. Um, Uh, keys yeah and you know let's not go too much in that but that's something like as a starter from oh that's interesting because i i use, would you be i'm a saxophone anyway <laughs> 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 but 
but that's also my instrument. So that's a part of, of me. But the thing is, you don't see what you play. Mm -hmm. I feel this. Yeah. Okay, as a pianist, if you look to, but but it's a different way to have the, it here or, or to have it there. And I need my breath. So it's a different way of being. So for me, the saxophone is more an extension, mm -hmm. the musician then. But as a piano player, you can't carry it and yes. have your instrument there. But that's not that shouldn't be a problem. But every time that you come there, you have to see from a oh, while. Wow, I see the 88 keys. 35 black, 53 white. So that's what I know. Okay, it's a piano. And then you play on it and say, oh, wow, but it doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but what you then do with it. So, so there are different, different ways. Yeah, and it needs some st sort of stability. Cannot put it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right. They're bigger and smaller. Yeah, it needs space. Right. But anyway, uh, we, we, just as an example, to ask people and then elaborate on it what what do you like with it what you dislike with the with the um, with your choice of the yeah. instrument and, and, and how many instruments do we have in the room oh we have eight pianos okay so it's also like you 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 can bring them together in in, in thinking about uh, this yeah and i think if there are eight pianos it's a fantastic opportunity to then dissect into what makes your piano and what makes your piano doesn't need to mean the same thing as for the other piano. Right. And what I also like about this icebreaker question is that it helps you to speak about yourself without being too intimate and personal, because you're still speaking about the musical instrument. The piano needs a lot of space. Not me. It's just the piano. And hence, it really facilitates a conversation where people can go sufficiently deep without being all too vulnerable if they don't want to. Yeah, I, I think that that's something I, in my experience, I, I use a lot. So, you know, I, I made a whole framework about everything there. There's a book there, there, there are cards. But at the very end, I start with the people themselves. Mm. Ask them, yeah. do you want to join? Do you want to share one or two songs? And then sometimes I don't even ask them to share it right away, but just to keep them in their in their head for a moment just everybody one song so you can do this with the with the with the, with a big group uh, in in the room let's say I, I did it once with with 100 people everybody different song and then i was talking about music like if you if you have a song now maybe miriam in, in, in your in your head or or even the the listener now could say make a choice just pick one song and then you can ask questions how many people are playing is it one, like, let's say, a singer-songwriter? Is it an orchestra? Or is it, a, let's say, the Fab Four, like a quartet? What genre is it? Is it pop, rock, jazz, trip? Is it, and how is it produced? Is it instrumental or is there singing involved? If there is singing involved, is it English or is it a different language? So th these are questions that you can ask, and you see that everybody's doing like, and, and most of the time, because it's popular music, most people have a song that it's around three minutes. That's what we're conditioned to. Most of them is with vocals, with voice. And in my experience, when I'm doing this, it's 90% is English. And my question would then be, if you choose a song of three minutes, how do you do strategy if your attention span is, let's say, three minutes? And if your song has vocals, how would it be if there would be no vocals? Which, is there music that you like without vocals? And what would it be? So it's you start with them, and that's the cool thing. So I don't have to do anything or bring bring there. I'm, I'm doing this later and then with s s sound elements or bring in music as well because people expect this. But at the very end, the real story is in their heads already. And mm. to activate this and bring to the table and let them say, hey, what was your song? Oh, I had this. Oh, I had the same. And the question is, wow, what could be our bias in listening if the two of us, we were, were, let's say, 80s rock and there's a singer and it's English. Say, okay, 
what would be a different listening? Let's find out if there's someone has something different and let's share. Why did you pick this? Why did you pick that? And then people say, yeah, I could, you just asked me one, I could have also used this. And that's, that's fine. It's not about being right. It's about, it's just about sharing who you are and also developing your vocabulary. And, mm. and what you just said, then you can talk about music, but at a certain moment say, hang on, actually we're talking about our organization. And it gives us new ways to to talk about something without, um, yeah, being uh, vulnerable on the one or, or let's say intimidating for someone else. Ah, so if I understand you correctly, so this would be the warm up to build a shared vocabulary and to get a sense of what we're talking about, to then apply it onto the organization or the team or whoever is in the yeah. focus of the workshop. Yeah, I did one workshop in in Paris with the European Parliament and uh, with with the Secretary General and then you ask them this question and then you facilitate <laughs> the conversation so don't moderate you just facilitate the conversation and then you see that people say oh i am here because the, there the question was different um, you also can use this for an organization We just talked about the leadership positions like a conductor, like a producer, like improviser, or let's say the, the indigenous part. What kind of leadership would we need for the next year, for example? Mm -hmm. This is, an, this is an, a question. And then you could also open the field and let people stay in the room. You know, we really can make it visual. And then you would see from, oh, I thought we would need more, let's say, score, more rules, and we need, would need someone to help us to make this at the very perfect high level. But I see my colleague or the CEO, he's on the improvisation side. I don't get it. What does this mean? Mm. Then you get into a discussion and that is very close because you have these two layers, the music layer. The music player, you just have chosen what you think it is. And again, it's not right or wrong. It's just interesting. And then you have a, um, a discussion together where you, where you try to understand different positions at the same time because it's, uh, everything is about the same organization. Yeah. And if you can help them to talk about this, then you can also work on... Yeah, on, on other things that are more focused and, and that are more connected. And then we leave the music and the music thinking aside. And then we really go into nitty gritty details that we didn't solve the, the last week. But it helps us to open the field to, to really say, oh, there, there are so many variations. But at the very end, it's very clear where we are, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. And what we need, depending on where we want to go. Yeah. Thank you. What reminds your number one facilitation challenge? And with challenge, you mean a situation where I... Whatever you wanted to mean. You know, the most challenging is if you have a, a very strict briefing with very limited time and there must be an outcome, then you're more on a, on a, on a functional level and really helping them to achieve what they want. But... If you do this very long, you know, you can do this, you help them, the client is happy. And sometimes you think, why didn't they do this by themselves? But mm. we know, because if you're part of the group, you can't facilitate because it's, yeah. not, it's not easy for you. It's not fat, fat today <laughs> for, for yourself because you, you have to, people see you as a person and not, um, okay, or should, uh, maybe you should bring in five hats or <laughs> whatever. But Yeah, I, I think that's one thing, but that's something that does not interest me so much. I want to open the field, let people, when they get out of the workshop, that they are something like, oh, okay, that was not only different, but I'm also more connected in what I already am. Mm. And that depends on the kind of workshop. That's often not a service design workshop where you just try to help them then you're more maybe more a trainer or an educator a conductor right of the conductor <laughs> and and in in another and and i'm an improviser i play since 40 years free jazz oh wow well and that means i'm very much used to get on the stage 
not for rehearsal, for, but for performance, not knowing what I play or what the others play. Mm -hmm. And because you've done this so often, you your ears get very, very, very big. <laughs> Because then you have to pick up something that's worth elaborating. And you always look for yourself, what you play and how you play. But while you play, you have to listen to the others, but also to the sum of everything. Because you want to create a music for, for everyone. And if it was good today, there's no guarantee that it will work tomorrow in the same way because that's performance. That's that's something, but that's more the the, the musical part. And I love it if I'm I'm in in, in workshops. You know, you know, when I was in the design thinking center at a certain time, I always wanted to be the co facilitator because I wanted to help the the facilitator to make hours and to do this good. And if something goes wrong, then I step in. Mm -hmm. And I loved it if nothing happens and the facilitator could tackle everything. And I loved it maybe even more now, maybe uh, also if something really was like, oh my God, that's really something that I'm experiencing for the for the first time. But that's something for me, then I'm on, then I have to yeah. act, react and, 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 and do it. And that's more for, for me personally, um, I understand very good organization or the orchestras and, and I, I love them all but as a person itself i'm much more an improviser beautiful and how you explain what you the skills you need as an improviser the big ears and knowing what's happening and being reactive to it these are beautiful skills to learn as a facilitator or yeah anyone who works also within a team and it reminds me of Improvisation theater, just yes. similar. You have to listen a lot and then... Yes, to... applied improvisation. So there's also many big groups. So the applied improvisation network. So yes. there's a lot of a lot of good stuff going out there. So yeah, that's really perfect. My thing is, or my analogy is music, because um, that, that that's why I'm experienced most in. And it's very inclusive. So it's um, there are so many links to to everything else, but listening, and it's a, it's such an open door. But listening is is such an Im important thing. And you might know from John Cage, four thirty three. That's the piece where no one is playing. Mm. That's a famous piece from nineteen fifty. Four minutes thirty three seconds. Is it the one? Four minutes and thirty three yeah. seconds. Yeah. And um, the idea is that. And it's not a joke. That that's maybe it's funny, but it's not a joke. Or some people think it's funny. For me, it's pretty serious, because it gives you a time frame of four minutes and thirty three seconds to listen what is already there. Mm. So you don't have to do anything but listen. And that's something you could you could also start your management meeting or the workshop with one minute or. To make it easy, but if you really do, 433, of silence, or let's say of non-intentional sound. So this means everyone who listens is asked not to do an intentional sound. So meaning like a joke or, and you just listen to what's already there. And in that way, you can reflect, what do we also have as an organization? So what is not the problem or what is already uh, here? And we don't have to listen for comprehension to understand it. We just have to listen for enjoyment like oh is this the refrigerator <laughs> or is this i hear an aeroplane wow that's really distant and then you can also use it like try to imagine if you hear the most distant sound like the airplane imagine that now you are sitting in this airplane what's it? so okay you, I think you get the idea, but but this listening, and you can do it everywhere. Open the window and just listen for a, for for a minute, and that's the basic because it will always be there. Also, when you make intentional sound, yeah, it will still be there, but it's not so loud. What I find interesting in this is the difference between starting a meeting with a meditation or with listening, where meditation is basically only listen to yourself, but maybe, yeah, even stop listening to yourself. <laughs> so detach from your thoughts. Where the listening activity seems as if it was the same 
from the outside because it's silent, but it's very different because you're focusing actually on everything that's outside of yourself instead of inside yourself. I would say, and, and the, 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 their, um, this is something that you can do. You can ask people, um, take two minutes, three minutes, and listen and write down everything that they heard. Mm. And you will understand that some people will say, mm, I heard the sound of my saliva, <laughs> or I heard the sound of my, oh, my neck. And these are also sounds. So they're mm. sounds. So it's if you listen really you, the, the most distant, then you can ask them what was the most distant, and some people might have heard in the airplane that might be the most dif- uh, distant one, and what's the closest sound, and this will be individual for everyone because I heard my, and someone else heard something else, yeah. and then oh, but that's also always there. So it's just a, a bit of of awareness. And talking about meditation, there um, it's called sonic meditation, and there are instructions for this. And uh, there's a, there will be a book, I think, in, in the very near future, where um, on 365 days, um, different people from all over the world have um, g- given sonic meditation text instructions. And, and that's uh, to remember Pauline Oliveros, who came up with this uh, idea. And sure. there's... And the, the most famous one is uh, from Pauline Oliveros. She, she said, if I get it right, it was get out at night, uh, go out for a walk at night and walk, walk so silently that the sole of your feet become ears. That's the instruction. And then you get out and then you get back in. So it's, it's also about embodied listening. So mm. I'm, I'm listening with your ears. It's you listening with your whole body. And then, you know, I'm fascinated about everything with music, as you can maybe feel. But my thing is then the analogy. So hang on. If we would really listen to our organization now, mm, be here, over here. What is the closest to us? What is the farthest to us? Do we have influence? Now, and, and so on. You you can imagine what you want to do with it. So it's, it's it's the doing. And going, uh, bringing the facilitation, you can help people to do it themselves. So you you really help them to experience something that they already knew. Because what's new at listening, everything is doing at the same time uh, uh, every day. But the funny thing is, we also listen in our sleep. We close our eyes. Mm. Our our body is maybe lying there, but our ears are always on. So we get information. And that's why I used listening as one of the faces and not as a step in, in my framework, because listening is goes through all the other faces uh, through. And that's also the analogy with music, though there's always the listening part. And the listening for me is like getting any data into the organization and not just... Yeah and making something with it, but trying to understand how this continuous uh, information comes in and what we do with it. And when do we say, not now, like when we sleep, we say, hang on, now no concentration, we just want to sleep. So we yeah. just switch our brain off, the ears are open, but the brain says, no, that not. Or mm-hmm. in a conversation, that that's the cocktail party um, thing. There's a lot of things going on. That's also information. And if someone, people says your name, Miriam, then, then you turn yes. around. Yeah. Because we recognize what we already know. And it's the same with music. We like music that we already know. And if there's something new, then... Familiar. So. Yeah. yeah, we like familiarity. Wow. Thank you so much, Christoph, for sharing your perspective into the world of facilitation and service design. It was a pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> and I will put all the details on how to find you and reach out to you in the show notes. And did you want to share something about your cards? Yeah. So five years ago, I had the idea, how can I let people be more creative? Let's put it like, like that. And I came up with, um, with cards, like, like, and I called them gem cards. 
So that's that's a box, and and even the size is also very musical because it's exactly a forty-five, uh, one of the the old forty-five, uh, and and these cards have different triggers, and there's also one audio trigger. So if you you can even mm-hmm. scan it while on a Zoom call, and then you get to hear something. And I'm doing uh, something called Serendipity Lab in the beginning of a workshop. So everybody has to bring their headphones or their their earbuds. And I let them do 15 minutes or 20 minutes to think about their how might we question or their unanswered question or however you want to call it. And let them be open for triggers. So they hear something, they see a quote on the backside, there's a, a trigger questions or, or let's say a, a keyword and ask them to write down everything that pops up in their mind. Like, oh, I have to buy milk because uh, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Just to be open for serendipity. And um, I had the idea, so if someone wants to, um, would like to, you know, the, the cards are sold worldwide. So it's, um, yeah, you just have to go to Amazon or to your l- local bookstore. But I said, if you want, we I have five sets of cards. So if someone thinks, oh, I'm interested in these cards, maybe just write an email to you, Miriam, and, um, and tell you how they want to use it or why they want to use it. Just one sentence is enough. And then we... We do a raffle and uh, and send out five of the of the gem cards. Beautiful. So, yes, and we'll add the information to the show notes. So, if you would like to use the gem cards in your facilitation in life, drop me an email, and then fingers crossed, you'll be the new owner of the cards. Thank you for this generosity, Christoph. Thank you. My pleasure. Wonderful speaking to you. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.